those of you that don't know me, my name is Ollie Husema. I look after Google's Optimize Your Life program across EMEA. I do this spiel at the start of every session, so I'm not going to bore you by going into it. Um, suffice to say, if you'd like more information, go forward slash OYL. If you'd like to be a wellness champion, please email me at ollie at google.com. So I'm delighted to, to welcome you to the second in our mini inspiration series for July. Uh, we actually have our first speaker here, Ben. Um, so if you didn't have enough questions the last time, you can go and harass him after the session. Um, we're delighted to welcome English Joe, Joe Matthews. Um, he's an absolute superstar. Um, he has a fascinating story um, to tell us. And uh, certainly having looked at his website and having spoken to him to date, um, I know that he's, uh, he's going to keep us all quite enthralled. Um, as a, a heart transplant patient, um, an amazing athlete, and someone that has achieved quite phenomenal things, um, considering. So I'm going to invite Joe to come up here. Um, we've got a few slides, but he's simply just going to tell his story. Um, and then if anyone has any questions, then please feel free to ask them at the end as well. OK? Joe. Cool. I'm not professional, so don't expect anything good. <laughs> right, um, I'm Joe Matthews. I'm from Suffolk in, well, England. Um, small fishing town called Lowestoft. Um, ever since I was younger, really, um, I've been into sport. I've played rugby since I was like the age of four. And yeah, this is my story basically. Um, yeah, so I started playing rugby when I was four. Touch rugby with my, my dad was my coach. Um, my brother played as well. Um, progressed quite swiftly through that to be fair. Um, got playing for Captain Norfolk. I played for Norfolk, Captain Norfolk from the age of like, I think 11 played Captain Norfolk and I went through and um, captained them for a few years and then got selected to play for Eastern Counties um, when I was 14, I think, yeah, 14. And um, yeah, it looked like, you know, rugby was going to be my thing, you know, I was getting on really well with it. Um, yeah, it was the kind of, yeah, it was the life I was going to pursue, I guess. Anyway, um, got some good family friends who live in California in America and Mum and Dad come up to me one day and they said, oh, look, we're going to go to America, spend Christmas over there. Um, and like every rugby guy my age at the time, you know, we've, it's been drilled into us, wherever you go, take your rugby boots because, you know, there's always a rugby team who are willing to, you know, let you join in and train and whatnot. So I took my rugby boots over there. And, um, oh, that's early. Anyway, um, took my rugby boots over there and... Basically, yeah, when got introduced to my, I call him my uncle, he's not really my uncle, but like a good family friend anyway. Went and played for, went and trained with one of his team, the team he used to play for. Anyway, they fell in love with me and they kindly invited me back over the following summer to um, play seven-a-side rugby in a few seven-a-side rugby tournaments. Um, so I went back home, worked really hard and you know, like Saturday job at the time because I was only young and went over and played in a load of seven-a-side rugby tournaments but like proper adult level. I was only 15 at the time. Um, so I went over there, played in all these tournaments across California, did Las Vegas Midnight Sevens, all big rugby tournaments. You probably haven't got a clue what I'm on about but it's a big deal, it's a big deal over there anyway. So I played in these tournaments and at the end, and at these tournaments they had like particular university scouts and everything. And they, a few of them come and approached me afterwards and said, you know, what college do you go to? Um, you know, we'd like, we'd like you to come and play for our university. And, um, you know, I turned around and said, oh, I'm only on holiday, I'm 15, I didn't even go to college yet. Um, and they were like, okay. Well, they went and spoke to a few guys on my team. And one of the, one of the guys on the team happened to be um, worked in the international department at the local college to where my rugby team was from, and come up to me and said, "Look, Joe, this is something which could be a possibility. Go back to England, have a word with your parents. You know, a lot of universities are showing a great interest in you. Come out here and um, you know try and get a 
apply for your visa, come out and become a student so you can work your way and obtain the grades and then, you know, ship on to university. But obviously scholarship all paid for, so, you know, that's, that's what I went home and did. So I went home, had the stat Saturday job. I um, was a lifeguard at the time, so, you know, I worked worked hard when I went when I wasn't at school, I did sixth form and was working part time and then end of my sixth form year, got decent grades but I'd applied and I'd applied for my visa and I got accepted. So I went over to America to pursue a career in rugby, but to the US government it was to pursue a career in education so I could get my visa. Anyway, um I'm ramble on a bit here. So I went over there and you know did really well at school. One of the things they said in your visa, you know, you have to do well at school. If you don't do well at school, you'll get sent back. You know, so you know, made sure I did well, achieved all high grades. So basically, I was eligible to go to Berkeley because you need a high GPA over there or what, whatever. So anyway, <laughs> um, did all these different tournaments and stuff, played in all these games and all these leagues. Aptos, the team I was playing for, um, we managed to get to the national semi-finals, so out of the whole of America, we got to the semi-finals. We lost, we didn't become national champions, but we got to um, the semi-finals, so we got second. But of course, me playing rugby over there grew more interest from all these people outside and were like, you know, who is this Who is this Joe Matthews or English Joe, as I was called over there, um, being English, my name Joe. Anyway, um, yeah, so they come up and they said, look, we'd really like, you know, we're, we're really interested you. I had San Francisco Golden Gate, which is like the top premiership side, say, in the country. Um, I had University of Berkeley really interested, University of Moraga. Um, basically, they were fighting over me. I had University saying, come and come to our university. No, come to our university. Well, if you come to our university, we'll give you a Dodge Ram or, you know, offering me all these cars and... Went back um, in Christmas um, 05, so 2005 in Christmas, went back, and I, you know, I developed myself as a great athlete, I was really big, you know, not fat or anything, I was really big, um, you know, I'd shot up, I'd filled out, you know, I was a decent sized rugby player and like someone you didn't want to mess with on the field, I guess. Anyway, um, went back, showed off basically to my family, look what I've Look what I've made myself into. Um, look what all these different colleges and professional teams are offering me. Um, basically told my mum and dad, well, I would not just told them, but basically said, you know, sat down with them, talked and said, look, I've got this team interested. I've got this professional club interested. Looks like I've made it as a rugby player. That's going to be my career now. Um, you know, you ain't got to worry about me anymore. I've, I've, I've made it. Anyway, um, so that was Christmas 05. And then I went back after New Year, had New Year with my family and my friends and everything. Went back after New Year and playing all these tournaments again, um, all these games, all these league games, doing really well. Um, looked like I was going to finish that season out and then move up and go into whoever was interested. And in February, a um, couple of games, I started feeling quite breathless and... Like I wasn't, I wasn't the first to do a loose ball on the ground. You know, I was always like the second one there, and it wasn't like me. I was always the first one there, and my coach could notice. And um, we're playing against Berkeley in a national, in like a national league game. And 70 minutes into that game, I was over on my hands and knees, basically, you know, gasping for air. So my co coach took me off and said, "All right, Joe, you worked hard this game." come off rest, you know, we don't need you, we won the game. You know, you just rest rest for 10 minutes until the end. At the end of the game, felt fine, because I sat down and hadn't done nothing for 10 minutes. Went to the went to the bar afterwards, had a few beers with everyone, you know, everything, everything like normal. My uncle, or I call my uncle, the people I was living with at the time had decided to go on holiday. Um, so they, they went at home, so I was all home alone, went home, um, I used to sit in the hot tub and just, you know, chill out and recover after a hard, hard game of rugby. 
Anyway, um, went home, sat in the hot tub, felt fine, went up, um, got out of the hot tub, starting to cough a bit. So I thought, oh, I'll give my mum and dad a call. Um, they'd be up now. I'll give, I'll give my mum and dad a call, just tell them how I'm feeling. I'll text Rod and Kelly, who I was living with, and just told them, you know, what the situation was. And um, mum said, make sure you go to the doctors tomorrow morning, you know, being mum. I thought, no, I've only got a cold. Yeah, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Anyway, didn't go to the doctors the next day. And um, actually went surfing, I think. Um, felt, felt fine. Did um, the gym. Cross, I used to do this thing called CrossFit, which is like a big military base like um, um, workout plan which with all the team. So did that on Tuesday, trained Tuesday night, the rugby team. Wednesday, um, my mate come come knocked at my door, can't let's go to college because we used to take it in turns to drive each other to college. We used to park um, in the um, sports side of campus and then there's a set of stairs that went over onto the academic side. We used to race each other up the stairs, and they'll always come first. Got to the um, top of the stairs, and he's miles in front of me. And on, again, I'm crying out like an old woman, like, <laughs> and he, he's, he's like, oh, man up, man up, girl, and stuff, stuff like that. I'm like, anyway, um, I said, you know, do you mind if we go to the college doctor after we've been to our first class? Thinking, I'm in America. This band, they'll give me something for something. They've got, you know, a tablet for every type of, you name it. They've got, they've got a tablet for it. Anyway, so I went to the doctor afterwards. She did the general stethoscope to my heart, lungs, and everything. Scared the hell out of her. Um, and she told me to go straight to the local hospital to have a chest X-ray. She phoned ahead to let them know I was coming. Um, didn't go straight there. Stopped off to get a sandwich. I had a mobile phone going off. Joe, why aren't you there yet? I told you to go straight there. You told me you'd go straight there. I'm like, oh, I'm only just stopping off for a sandwich. No, I'm hungry. Um, went there, and um, I think about an hour later, I get a phone call back at, back at home. Missed the phone call. The house phone then goes off, and I've got the college doctor on the phone again, basically saying, Joe, you need to get to the Santa Cruz Hospital. ASAP. Um, don't want to scare you or anything, but you got so something. Something's up, and I need you to get there straight away. I'm like, well, you're not scaring me as such, but I am feeling a bit on edge now because you've shown me you're in a bit of a panic and everything. Um, and she said, right, you need you need someone to drive you there. I can't drive myself because I'll probably be there overnight. Um, so my girlfriend at the time, she drove me there, and she said, I've called ahead to let you know, let them know you're coming. I said, well, will you mind just telling me what's going on now? And she said, well, you've got an enlarged heart and a load of fluid on the lungs. Well, fluid on the lungs, I thought, well, I'm not the first person to have fluid on the lungs. Um, take some for that, get rid of it. Large, enlarged heart, I thought, well, that's common in athletes anyway because they're always working, you know, they're always working out, they're always doing physical activity, so the hearts are generally a bit bigger than someone who doesn't play sport or whatnot. Anyway, so I went to Dominican walked into this massive hospital, there's all these patients sitting there, like, you know, waiting to see someone, and I had a doctor there waiting for me with a clipboard, Joe Matthews, as I walked in, because I was, like, looking around like I didn't know the place. Um, I was like, yeah, and they're like, come with me, and they took me, and my girlfriend at the time, took me straight to the, um, to a, to a separate room so they could check me out. So basically, um, I had all these tests, I had all these different things they were testing me on, and basically I had an enlarged heart and they couldn't reduce the swelling of it. So I had all these pick lines in me, and you know, bear in mind my mum and dad are in England, and the people I'm living with, who I call family, are on holiday, you know, pieing up, doing whatever, and there's me in a bed, you know, what's going on, and you know, one minute, feeling really fine, fit and everything. Next minute being told you can't do anything, you just have to lay here and wait until we tell you what's up. So they they said that. I remember going to, I can't, if I'm honest, I can't really remember a great deal of it because well, I'll tell you in the story later. But um, basically I remember waking up there um, and my dad being at the end of the bed 
and I'm thinking, you know, you were in, you are in England, which is quite a way away, <laughs> um, you know, from when I last remembered. You know, I wake up, my dad's at the end of the bed, I'm like, what are you doing here? And my uncle and aunt had come off their holiday, and they're at the end of the bed. And basically I'm like, well, what are you guys doing here? I'm fine, I've only got coal, I think, you know. And they're like, well, nothing's up, Joe, you know, we just come here because we wanted to, we heard you were in hospital and we just wanted to check up on you. My dad was like, oh, I had extra time off work. Um, so I, because my mum and dad were meant to come out and see me before, um, in the, a bit later anyway. He said, oh, I got some extra time off work, so I come out sooner and I'll, I'll meet your mum and your brother here. Anyway, so basically um, got admitted into Santa Cruz Hospital, told that I had an enlarged heart, got taken to the cardiac ward. My dad was there like I said and basically um, all these tests were going on and they're talking behind my back they weren't telling me anything not telling my dad anything doing all these discussions I had people coming in and out of my room looking at me marking me with a clipboard and I'm like what the hell's going on you know and they're walking out leaving going to see someone else going to talk to someone else then person's coming in for clipboard asking me a few questions heading out and then basically <laughs> Oh, I say basically a lot, don't I? Anyway, um, and then the Gla Jim Glancy, the cardiac, you know, the cardiologist there, who was my cardiologist at the time, come in and he just did a few more tests. And I said, look, do you mind just stopping and just tell me what's going on? I know I'm young in America, but in England, you know, I'd know what was going on like a few days ago. You know, just treat me like an adult now. I'm asking you to tell me what's up. So we shut the door and he basically sat on the end of my bed and um, with my dad and basically told me that I had an enlarged heart and um, a very strong arrhythmia. So my heart wasn't beating normal like it's supposed to do. It's like kind of spasming out and going all over the place. And I'd have to have a defibrillator fitted, which little device that fits in underneath your collarbone and which would shock my heart every time it goes out of control and make it back into that steady rhythm. Um, so he, he told me that, so basically, you know, he said there's a one side effect, you can't do any physical activity. Well, you know, before, it's quite emotional for me anyway. Um, before I'd made it as a rugby player, I'd, um, you know, my career had just been, you know, wiped, wiped clear. Anyway, um, he told me that, and he said, like, we can't, we're not going to do the operation here. We want to transfer you to Stanford, which is, like, the best place in the whole world for cardiology. Um, you know, you'll be in better care there, which, you know, I thought, well, what's, this is happening to me. I didn't really give a, I couldn't really care, to be honest. You know, I thought, well, that's my life over. Um, went, to the, went to Stanford, and my mum and my brother are there. And um, again, I, this is all kind of faint. Went into the operation to have this defibrillator fitted. Um, it was meant to take like an hour and a half, two hours. And two hours and 20 minutes later, my mum and sit, mum and dad are sitting outside with my brother, and the um, alarms go off and everything. At the end of the operation, they slow your heart down to test the defibrillator, and my heart didn't. Didn't respond to the defibrillator. Oh my, getting all emotional for anyway. Um, my heart didn't respond to the defibrillator, and the defibrillator worked. My heart was that weak, didn't respond, and a cardiac arrest. I was actually, it was clinically dead for like five and a half minutes. So, um, mum and dad are in wrecks. To be fair, I didn't have a clue what was going on. <laughs> um, yeah, so the next, next thing I remember is waking up in intensive care, um, going to sit up, but can't sit up. Um, skip this. Right. Can't sit up, basically, because um, you, you see this thing here? That's, the, that's a big machine. It's about this big. Um, there's pipes going from it and leading all the way along and going into me. 
and basically pump my heart for me. Um, you can see about there. Anyway, um, so this this machine comes out, it's pumped my heart. So I wake up and I, no, I can't sit up. So I look and I see this machine. I see like um, blood firing down one, spinning around and firing down the up, firing up the other. I kind of panic a bit, which I regret because you know, made my mum nearly have a heart attack. To be fair, um, so I um, panic a bit. I am um, trying to rip rip the pipes out of my, you know, they're in me, strapped to me. I'm trying to rip them out on all these IV lines and pick lines in in me. I'm trying to rip everything out. I've got um, camera. Cameras up my nose, a load of tubes and everything. I'm trying to rip all them out. Sorry if I'm painting a bad picture here. I'm just trying to set 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 the scene. So I'm ripping all these stuff, ripping all this stuff out. Basically, I'm being a complete, excuse my French, but asshole to everyone. Um, and my brother, my dad, and a few other doctors are basically hold me down. I'm tied down to the bed, and um, Again, I, I can remember little things, but I can't. It's, to me, it just seems like a bad dream. I can't can't remember everything. Next thing I remember waking up in um, the cardiac ward, and a doctor, um, a doctor standing over me, Bobby Robbins, who I've mentioned before. So um, anyway, Bobby Robbins is standing there, and he's basically told me, you know, I've got two choices. I have a heart transplant. Or I don't, and I eventually die, which which I kind of thought was a bit stupid, you know, you know, why would I want to die, um, you know? But in America, I have to do what all the Americans do, I have to ask because there's lawsuits and stuff. Like my family could sue if I had the transplant and I didn't really want it or something like I don't know. So I had to basically say yes, I want the heart transplant. I was then asked, uh, right, you need to be. So you can't be completely weak when you have a transplant, so you need to get your fitness back. Hence why, on this slide here, on um, uh, no. um, on, on this, on, my dad, I wake up one next morning. So I'm going on. I um wake up one morning and there's an exercise bike in my room. I'm like, my dad's at the end of my bed, or sitting beside me, like looking, going, it's my idea. Um, he'd spoken to this professor, Dr. Robbins, and basically said, you know, do you mind if we get Joe an exercise bike? Um, he's like, I'll make sure we get, he'll be a lot fitter for the transplant, you know, if you put him on that, you know. And Bobby Robbins thought, well, um, he has just had a, he has just cardiac arrest, and he has got that machine pump in his heart, and a little thing went off in his head and he thought, well, he's got that machine pump in his heart, so he doesn't really need to pump his heart himself. He's quite alright to go on the exercise bike. So for a week I um went on this exercise bike four times a day. I had ankle weights on and I had like these wrist grip things. Four times a day I was on this exercise bike trying to get fit for this so I was ready to have a transplant. Um, I'd go for walks, but when I wanted to go for a walk, that meant that this big thing here had to come with me, and that meant one of the nurses having to walk around and follow me, basically. I could only walk for like five minutes because they wouldn't allow, not because I wasn't physically able to, because the nurses couldn't physically push this, <laughs> this thing around. My mum and dad weren't allowed to touch this piece of equipment. Right, so that I'd walk around the ward for like five minutes, and I'd keep up. I'd go back and rest, and I'd, I'd be like, oh, "I want to go for another walk." And the nurse would be really, really, you know, that's not happening. We're not doing any more today. Anyway, so um, I kicked up a bit, bit of a fuss. I was a bit of a, bit of a pain to be honest, but um, kicked up a bit of a fuss enough to have a nurse come out. Uh, the person in charge of this machine. The per that person to come out of whatever she was doing to my room to teach my mum and dad how to operate this machine if the power goes. So that my mum and dad could then push, well my dad, not my mum, my dad could then push 
this machine for his, because my dad's quite a big guy, push this machine wherever I wanted to go, I could walk, my dad could push it. Um, so it's on a battery. The battery lasts, I think, four hours. But, you know, just in case it doesn't, there's a pump. Right, and um, this nurse is basically sit, sat down on a sat down beside my bed. My mum and dad are around, and like, right, we're going to unplug it. It's going on this battery. Um, I need to t need to show you how to operate it if it was to switch off. So switch off. She switches off this machine. She's got this pump. She's like sitting there, pumping this, pumping my heart basically in her hand, showing my mum and dad how to use it. And they're like, right now, it's your go. Pass it over to my dad. My dad's like, yep. Pumping it. Pass it to my mum. My mum at this point's like <laughs> shaking everything. She gets the pump and no word of a lie, my mum drops the pump. And I, my heart goes in my mouth. I'm like, <gasps> like holding my breath thinking like, what's going to happen now? And no word of a lie, she, the, the nurse who was showing my mum, my dad, went, that's all right. If this happens, you just stamp on it like this. <laughs> And I um, switched it back on, and from that point, I didn't allow my mum to operate that machine or anything. It was just my dad. Anyway, um, cut long story short, that happened. I got fit, and I was able to have a heart transplant. Um, April 2nd, got a phone call. I'd had all these nurses in, asked me a load of stuff, doing all these tests. I had people coming in my room at like 5 in the morning. We want your blood. We want you know do more tests. And I'm like, oh, just leave me alone. So I wanted to watch um, a movie. So I sat down with my mum and watched Forrest Gump. I think it was one of the DVDs I could have chosen. I I chose, I chose. Anyway, so I watched Forrest Gump. And at the end of Forrest Gump, the leaf falls from the tree. I don't know if you all watched it, but the leaf falls from the tree. And no word of a lie, the phone rang. And I thought, right. Looked at my mum, joked, and thought, oh, that's probably my heart. And um, went outside. Mum went outside to listen to the nurse. And the nurse looked over my mum and was like, "It's Joe's heart." And um, come in, come in the room, told me I had a heart. I was all like ecstatic. Yes, I've got a heart. Um, they said, "Right, it's going to be with you in like say six hours, no more than six hours. We need to clean you completely." So they did the whole iodine stuff. Clean me, made me all sterile for the operation. 2 a.m. or 1 a.m. I went down to have to the theatre to have um, the transplant. The Eve, I don't know if you ever heard of a guy called Dr. Norman Shumway. He's the first guy to ever perform a heart transplant in America. He's from Stanford. He died of cancer earlier that year, and they had a memorial on April 2nd in the evening. Um, which all these doctors who worked at Stanford and worshipped this guy were meant to be going to. But for some reason I had a heart come for me, so they couldn't go to this thing, and they had to perform, you know, my transplant. So um, went down, don't really remember too much, I just remember having Bob Marley on in my iPod or something like that, saying goodbye to mum and dad, I'll see you when I get out, and having this transplant. Come out, transplant seven hours later, went down a right treat, really, really good. Um, and I think I'll just jump and cut. I'm going on a bit. Um, had, had the transplant, ICU, was in there 10 days and was out back on the cardiac, cardiac ward. Earlier before, I went down to the transplant when I was waiting for the heart. Some guy had come in and me being all competitive. I wanted to, you know, know who was the fastest person out at the hospital, you know, and stuff like that. Who's had a heart transplant? What's he done since? You know, what's possible? Because I thought, when I got told I was going to have a heart transplant, I thought, A, my life's over. That's me, wheelchair bound. Stupid to think that, but at the time, I'd never, never been familiar with transplants. I was 19. You know, you, you don't expect a 19-year-old to have to have a heart transplant. You think of all old people and pensioners, you know. Anyway, um, they said, we had this guy, he's had a transplant. Six months later, he's back skiing again. I'm like, all right. 
he's actually coming in for a visit. Oh, oh, do you mind bringing him down and asking him if he'd come and have a chat with me, please? Um, he basically come in and he said, he was all cocky and, um, you know, I had a transplant. I was out of the hospital within, I think, two months. I um, was back skiing six months later. Um, you know, I'm fast. I'm the fastest there is and the fastest there ever will be. Well, the competitive nature of me, I was like, right. Um, I went, that's great. That's, I really appreciate you coming down here. Just before you go, all your, I, he stopped. He looked at me and I was like, all your records are now going to be broken. Guaranteed. Which I didn't have no control over, you know, because something could have gone wrong in the operation or it could have been, you know, slumped down. Anyway, so I had the transplant. Ten days later, I was in, out of intensive care and back on the cardiac ward. And from that point on, I was like, right, my goal is to get out of the hospital as quick as possible. A week later, I leave the hospital. So I just had a heart transplant. I think he was in there a month, he said to me. I was out of there a week later. I was moved from cardiac ward over to the home apartments, which are like these block of apartments for patients who have to go back regularly for tests and stuff. Moved out of the hospital to these home apartments. Um, I was in the home apartments for a month. And then after that, I was given the all clear to go back and get on with my life. Um, I had little things little things happened. I'd go back every day for tests. My fourth day I went back like, Joe, you need to start walking a little bit now. Don't use the, stop using the like little golf buggies to get to the, get to the hospital. I'm like, there's golf buggies? <laughs> um, I'd walked, basically I've walked everywhere. And from when I left the hospital, I never used a lift. So I had all these lifts and I was on like the fifth floor. And I'd walk to the hospital every day with my mum and my dad. And my mum would be like, oh, I'm just getting a lift. And I'd look at my dad. My dad's like, do you want to take the stairs? I'm like, yeah, yeah. So we took the stairs every day. Anyway, so I'm having this appointment, fourth day in. And this, this person I'm seeing goes, right, we need to start, make you start walking a bit. And I laughed. He looked at me. He's like, what's so funny? I looked at my dad and I laughed at him. My dad's kind of laughing. And they go, mm, what's so funny? I went, well, start walking a bit. What do you mean by a bit? He's like, well, you need to start walking, you know, like, to the hospital and everything. I'm like, well, me and my dad yesterday and my brother, we walked around the entire campus. Well, I don't know if you know how big Stanford is, but I think the circumference is like eight miles, something stupid like that. And throughout the day, we got up really early, and throughout the day, I was just walking around, looking at this, you know, looking at different places at Stanford. He's like, Really? And laughed, thought I was joking for him. I'm like, no, seriously, I have. Look, here's a picture of me here, and here's a picture of me there. And um, uh, he's like, wow. Um, okay, well, excuse me a second. He walked out, went and told a few other people, like Sharon Hunt, come in. She's like the best cardiologist there is in the world. Um, Joe, I want, I want you to be my patient now. So I now had like, well, okay, um, we need to do a few more tests, physio tests, etc. Um, went to do the physio physio tests. Um, they score you on a chart from like one to ten. I was scoring like thirty. So they couldn't actually physically write down my score on the chart. Um, yeah, I was scoring off the charts. Everything they asked me to do, I'd look at and think, is that it? And and do it. Um, I was, my friends, when I was in hospital, because there's a bottom line of my insurance, because I had top insurance because I was playing rugby, the bottom line of my insurance policy basically said, Joe, if you know, if you require a heart transplant, we will not pay for the, or an organ transplant, we will not pay for the transportation of the heart, which in an organ transplant is kind of the most important thing you know, to get the organ from the donor to the recipient. Um, so all my friends raised money and did a load of marathons and all these fundraising events. And I said to them on the bed when they'd done it, you know, thanks very much, I'll do it with you next year. And the nurses heard me and the doctors heard me and they, they came to me after one and said, Joe, don't be stupid, you know, set realistic goals. Um, you won't be able to do anything like that for another couple of years. Um, <laughs> 
there was a wharf to wharf event, which is I think about 10k in Santa Cruz, which you jog from one pier to the other pier. And a few friends were doing it. I said, I'll do it with you. And they went, sure. I'm like, yeah, I'll do it with you. And I told the doctors about this, and they're saying, no, Joe, don't you dare. Anyway, don't don't be stupid. So, because I was out of the hospital's, you know, responsibility, then I could do what I wanted. And I felt physically fine in myself to go do it, so I did it. Had a checkup like a week later, walked into the room with the medal around my neck. <laughs> I've done this, I've done that. And they're, they're, they're just gobsmacked. Um, I said, look, I'm going to be doing that marathon. I'll do the half marathon like my friends did. Did the half marathon um, in training for the London marathon. So a year later, just over a year later, so I think April, I don't know, April 3rd was the transplant. April, Mid-April was the London marathon the following year. I moved back to England. i had done this half marathon with my friends, like I told them I would in training for the full London Marathon and I completed the London Marathon. Um, did it in something stupid like five hours or you know nothing nothing special but just to say I completed it and proved to all the doctors hey you know there's no limits here as long as I'm feeling fine. That's that's my heart now. I don't look at I don't look at my heart like it's someone else's heart. I look at it like it's mine. I can do what I want. You know, as long as I feel fine, I'll go ahead and do it. So I did this. I did this London marathon, and I was like, right, I need to set up a website so um, people who were in the shoes I was in can see that you know a physical life and the benefits of an organ organ transplant, what you can do afterwards. So um, set up EnglishJoe.net, being you know English and my name Joe, and that was what everyone called me over there. Set up EnglishJoe.net, and I now post. Oh, skip slide. Yeah, I now I now post basically everything I do onto this website. So, you know, some little, some some guy could be in a bed, some woman could be in a bed, needing a life-saving transplant, and they can go on there and they can go. All right, well, this is actually possible. It's not as bad as what it sounds. Um, since since the transplant, I've done the London Marathon twice. I've always been competitive and was told I could never play rugby, so I took up sprinting. Entered the British Transplant Games and took gold in all the events I entered in. Um, got selected to represent Great Britain in the World Transplant Games, which are in Aus- which were in Australia in 2009. Um, didn't take gold in everything. Um, which I was slightly disappointed about, but then at the time, but then at the time I found out that I was the only guy or the only athlete on the track that actually had a heart transplant. Everyone else had had a kidney transplant. So I was thinking, you know, so there's all these sprinting things. So like the 100 meter sprint, for example, when someone lines up for the race, their heart and their brain is telling their heart, you're now going to run 100 meters. So the heart naturally starts beating faster. My, because it's a foreign heart, there's no brain endings, there's no nerves going from my heart to my brain. So when I run 100 meters, when I my muscles start demanding more blood, that's when my heart starts beating faster because my brain isn't in communication with it. So like the first 50, 60 meters, everyone's like like that. And then the last 40, 40, 30 meters, I just start, I power through and I get past everyone, um, but there was some there's some fast guys there, so I, only, I think I only got bronze, um, and I was a bit I was a bit I was really annoyed, so I entered the 400 relay, 4 by 400 relay, and I took the bat on third I think no second I took the bat on second, and the person who ran before um, didn't really give me much hope. Um, I received the baton. There was like, I think there was like four other runners in front of me, like 100 meters around. Well, because there's a heart, and the 400 meters, you don't go flat out straight away. You kind of build yourself up into it. When I get to like 200 meters, my heart's like, oh, you're running here. We'll start being a bit fast. So you gradually get, gradually put on the pace a bit. And 200 meters in, I went past everyone. <laughs> I carried on running and finished 
finished with a good like 30 second lead on the people behind me. So we got round, we ended up getting it. So I got my gold. It was a team event, but you know, I got a gold medal in the World Games. So I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, did the British Games again last couple of years. Did it in Bath. Got selected to represent Great Britain again in Sweden. Um, got given the all clear at the same time to play rugby again. So I was like, right, I'm back playing rugby. I'm allowed to play rugby again. The game I love, I'm, I'm doing that now. I don't care about, don't care so much about the athletics. I'm going to train and I want to get good at rugby. So I went back training with rugby, joined the local team. I moved up to, I live in Retford now, North Nottinghamshire. So I work, work just over in Sheffield, which is right next door to Doncaster. Doncaster Knights have a good rugby team. I thought, right, I'll pop in and see if I can get training with them. So I'm training for Doncaster Phoenix, which is like the team just below the Knights. Um, trained and was playing for their second team. And then the end of this season just gone, I got called up the last two games to play for the first team. Um, so it's now gone into pre-season for this year. So it looks like I've got my first team spot, but you know, I'll gradually work my way up. Anyway, so I'm playing that. So I haven't gone focus and complete haven't focused completely on my running. So um, when I told the team managers of the Great Britain team that I'm not running anymore on rugby, they were a bit, you know, well we don't want you to play rugby. And I'm like, well, you're not telling me not to play. I'm playing it, whatever you say. Um, the doctor's given me the all clear to do so. That's a game I love. I'm playing at end of. Um, but they still want me on the team. So if I survive the season, I guess, like I did this year, um, I went, I go on to, I went on to Sweden this year, and end up getting a silver medal in the four by one hundred. And because I'm not sprint training anymore and just rugby, I missed out on bronze in every event I did by about hundred, couple of hundreds of a second, something stupid like that. But you know. Um, on here, on the live, I'm beating well, and I'm playing rugby, which is the game I love again. So, you know, that's pretty much me. I feel I've kind of lost you all, but so yeah, just trying to show the benefits of organ donation. You haven't lost us at all. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. No. So, what what are your plans for this year? Um, well, I've got the British Transplant Games in Belfast, which are next week. Um, I'll be over there for a week competing. I've made a come, come to a couple of decisions, because I'm in the gym a lot with my rugby training, and I'm not so much doing all my running and everything. I'll do, like, the relays, and I'll do something like discus or javelin, something which, you know upper body strength comes in quite nicely too so you know I've got a feeling I'll do quite well at that so I'm going to do that in um, Belfast and I also got chatting to the cycle team in the UK so I've got I can get on a bike and I can work hard but I don't seem to get tired on a bike because my body weight's taken off supported by supported by two wheels so I, I just stop pedaling when I'm a bit tired and I'll start pedaling again so I'm going to take up cycling, I think, and do do well in that. On off, yeah. So British Games next week. I think tomorrow I'm starting a tag rugby tournament at Doncaster, which isn't contact, but it's like um, tag rugby is when you got like two two flags on your hips and getting ripped off, and you're tackled. But I'll start. Tag rugby tournament tomorrow, Belfast next week. Um, I snowboard, so I'm entering the, I've been selected to represent Great Britain in the Winter Transplant Games. Um, I think I'm the only snowboarder, so there's, there's a few medals there. Um, snowboarding in March, and then just my rugby, really. You know, wherever I think we're going to go on tour to America, and I'm in the middle of arranging. My team I play for now. Let's have a game with the team I played for in America. No, so 
it's on the app. Get to see a bit of the world. The world, the world games are in um, Durban, in South Africa, in 2013. So I'm looking forward to going there, and you know, fingers crossed, my health will be in great shape like it is now. Keep eating the right foods, doing what everyone should be doing, really. You know, keeping healthy, and hopefully I'll be there in, you know, in another couple of years, doing the thing. Anymore? Where did your heart, the new heart, come from? Um, it's getting recorded in it. Um, I can't legally say, so I'm not going to say. Um, I do know where it come from, but I'm not going to tell you where because all the laws and stuff. Oh, okay. okay. But, yeah. but it, they can't expect a 19-year-old who can't get out of bed with internet access not to have a look on the old obituary pages on oh, wow. go on on Google, <laughs> <laughs> so, which which is what I did, and because there's there's different rules. The, the weather was really bad. So I knew it could only come from a certain direction, and it's only allowed a certain amount. I think it's allowed six hours to get from the um, donor body to the recipient. So basically what, what you're saying is that people, while they're healthy, have to say, yes, I'm willing to be an organ donor, yeah, no, I'm not. And, the, then, and then if that person, something happens to that person, then it can be donated. Exactly, yeah. That's how it works. Yeah, like, um, I don't know if you... Who's English in this room? All right. Um, on your driver's license, you might say you're a do you're an organ donor, but that isn't enough. You need to actually physically go online and register, because that's just like, oh, you you might be an organ donor. It's not like, yeah, I will be an organ donor. So if you can go on EnglishDrow.net and um, there's a link on there, and you can sign up to be a donor, which I hope everyone does. Um, you know, because if it weren't for the organ I received, I wouldn't be here speaking or babbling on to you now, so. Okay, I'm going to bring it to a close because of the timing. Um, Joe, thank you so much. It was, uh, I'm sure, an emotional roller coaster for you, yeah. and I think for us too. Uh, it's been an amazing story and um, amazing to hear you tell it so, so from the heart as well. Um, so thank you. You're very googly. That's the highest compliment that we can pay, play to, pe pay to people, I'm sorry. Um, and thank you again for your time. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. Cheers.